Uh, welcome to the July meeting for Gene Mods. There are uh, more people than usual. Uh, this, is, this is good. Uh, I'd like to say, I think, uh, yeah, welcome. There are some teachers who are visiting uh, the school, uh, some high school teachers. Uh, welcome to them. Um, and there might be some iGEM people here. Am I right? Am I wrong? Yes? Hi, iGEM. Good to see you. Um, so, the way things going to go is basically last week there was the SEED conference, the Synthetic Biology Conference in Chicago. Um, and so I'm just going to give sort of a, a newsreel, I'm trying to be as quick as I can about the news in synthetic biology around uh, the world. And then we're going to have sort of a conversation where a few people uh, are going to recap interesting things from SEED. We'll talk about them. If we ask you to recap something, can you raise your hand so I know who it is? Okay. Okay, cool. We, yeah. we have a presentation. You have a presentation? Yeah. Okay, cool. If you want it on a flash drive, I can put it on. Um, all right. So, news in the synthetic biology world and also just around. Uh, first off, uh, if you guys are interested in communicating science, uh, I really recommend ComSciCon, which is a communicating science convention for grad students. Um, the uh, one this year is happening on August 6th. Um, well, it's, it's uh, the keynote uh, speaker is uh, giving a speech on August 6th, and then uh, if you really like the keynote speaker and you're interested in getting involved or like attending the full thing as a graduate student, um, you can sign up for it next year. So I'm going to talk about uh, some sort of like non-research article things first, and then I'm going to go into sort of quick recaps of the research article. Uh, the first thing I want to say is, just in the past few months, I found some actually really, really good um, resources online for just synthetic biology writing and news. Uh, and my favorites are the Engineering Biology Times from the uh, uh, EBRC, the Engineering Biology Research Consortium. Um, it's like a nice sort of feed of all these different uh, articles that get aggregated by various people. Uh, and then the other one is the Plus Synthetic Biology Community. They have a great blog series. I think it's run by a guy named Stephen Burgess in the UK because he posts most of the things. But yeah, just really good, interesting writing that happens there. As an example, uh, there was this great uh, piece that I enjoyed reading. Uh, there was sort of this guy, Aaron Dye, who will show up later in the talk, um, uh, sort of recapped this uh, Boston synthetic biology outreach thing where a bunch of different iGEM teams sort of made exhibits uh, of their projects and got little kids interested in synthetic biology. So that was really nice. Um, another cool blog post on that uh, website is this sort of why plant piece uh, that Stephen Burgess posted, which sort of like a summary of uh, the uh, reasons for being interested in plant synthetic biology and the directions the field is going there. Uh, which I thought was very cool. However, I would uh, a word of caution on plant synthetic biology to not get overhyped. Uh, how many people here heard of Glowing Plant, the Kickstarter? Okay, yeah. So it was like one of the most popular Kickstarters of all time, raised like four hundred thousand um, dollars. And this MIT Technology Review article is all about how they hadn't been able to deliver on their Glowing Plant um, and sort of the challenges they ran up against, and how they sort of basically massively underestimated the difficulties that they have in that sort of synthetic biology project and turning it to, into a consumer product. Um, in terms of sort of DIY bio, um, uh, this was a, a, a nice uh, uh, little development. The NSF gave $300,000 to the University of Pennsylvania to develop this, uh, uh, basically a little uh, biology, a synthetic biology lab on a, on a bench top and to sort of bring it into in the high school students. So, uh, yeah. And as always, lots of CRISPR news. Um, there was a slightly less controversial Heroes of CRISPR piece in Nature. Um, this one was about the uh, actually unsung sort of graduate students and postdocs who did the work and who hadn't really gotten most of the attention. And it was, it was sort of profiling them and talking about how they deal with uh, being people who are like known for CRISPR but not known for CRISPR. Um, so I thought that was very interesting. Uh, and other interesting things, uh, the first proposed human test of CRISPR passed an initial uh, safety review at, uh, with the FDA. This is in the U.S. Um, and so now they have to uh, like go back to their individual, the University of Pennsylvania again has to go back to its uh, own sort of board of ethics and check with them and check with the FDA one more time. But it's the first uh, sort of step towards that. And so we took a step and China took a big leap. Um, 
So Chinese scientists are going to, uh, have announced that they're going to start a trial next month uh, editing human blood cells and using those to treat cancer with immunotherapy. Um, and then there's some other random interesting pieces that are sort of synthetic biology related. There's this de-extinction uh, article in Scientific American. So if you guys have heard of de-extinction, it's this thing George Church talks about a lot about sort of bringing back extinct organisms using synthetic biology and genetic modification of living organisms. And this is uh, talk, uh, scientists are talking about using techniques from de-extinction to uh, sort of bring back dead uh, genetic diversity in an organism, the black footed ferret, that almost went extinct and was whittled down to seven species, and so it's now incredibly inbred. Um, and then, this is not really synthetic biology, but just I thought this was interesting. The first ever uh, DNA sequencing experiment in space is set to uh, start this coming month, and it's using Oxford nanopores. Uh, handheld minion sequencer, which I just love Oxford Nanopore. They're not paying me to say that. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, I like them a lot. Uh, you can do lots of cool things with them. Um, and in terms of sort of money for synthetic biology, CRISPR Therapeutics raised $40 million more dollars, bringing their total to like $140 million uh, to uh, do sort of blood therapy and uh, other sort of uh, immediately interesting gene therapies. And then Synthworks, which is this uh, company based on adding an extra alien uh, sort of DNA base pair uh, to the gene and sort of expanding the genetic alphabet in that way and being able to incorporate a lot of new uh, amino acids raised $10 million. Uh, and equipment's getting cheaper, so AI Biosciences, they, they took a 3D printer, uh, a cheap $250 3D printer, and they turned it into like a high throughput sample analysis thing. And you can now do RT-PCR on it, it's like 20 times cheaper than a commercial prep device. So that's an interesting thing. And then Microsoft stored 200 megabytes of data in DNA, um, and they, they actually stored a uh, music video, OK Go, <coughs> this, two, this two shall pass. Um, so yes, DNA storage is uh, going interesting places. Uh, moving on to the actual sort of research articles, uh, and starting off with protein engineering, um, Andy Ellington's lab at UT Austin uh, developed a reverse transcriptase that's actually able to proofread and has much lower error rate than current reverse transcriptase. And he actually started with a, a KOD DNA polymerase and used a combination of sort of in vitro evolution and rational design and was able to get the uh, error rate down significantly. Um, uh, David Baker's lab, which does sort of de novo protein engineering. De novo protein engineered this super stable protein cage um, and out of like 60 subunits. Um, and so it sort of forms, and it's stable up to like 80 degrees Celsius in like super denaturing conditions. And you can also attach either 60 or 120 GFP molecules to it. And so now you have kind of like this standard candle in a cell that you can use to sort of measure relative fluorescence. Um, and there's also been some uh, work in optogenetics. Uh, this group uh, developed this uh, uh, optogenetic controller of uh, gene expression in E. coli, where this DNA binding protein, when you shine blue light on it, it can either bind and uh, activate transcription, or if you shine, or if you pulse blue light, it can repress transcription. So, optogenetics making progress. And then there was this interesting um, sort of review article about ways in which people are trying to uh, improve photosynthesis. Um, and yeah, I just thought this was uh, it was it was a good sort of overview of the the challenges of making rubisco better or uh, getting rid of sort of side reactions and things like that. Now, uh, in terms of synthetic circuits, Aaron Dye, the guy from before, um, he and uh, uh, some other people published uh, a cool review on control theory in synthetic biology, and this is basically how you use sort of principles from mechanical and electrical engineering and, and making things more robust, uh, systems more robust and more stable with respect to noise, um, and how that can be applied in synthetic biology. Um, uh, so. Uh, and that's really important because uh, uh, this other paper showed that um, basically in more crowded cellular environments like the actual inside of a cell, things get noisier and more stochastic. So even if you're modeling, um, like even if you're building a genetic circuit and you're testing it in like a dilute cell-free environment, the sort of macromolecular crowding inside a cell might make it a little more noisy. Um, and also in terms of building new parts um, and the uh, Jay Kiesling's lab has started building this uh, new inducible promoters in yeast, uh, which is interesting because uh, promoters, pe people usually don't engineer uh, uh, inducible promoters very much uh, because it's 
it's difficult, it depends on the organism. Uh, but they are able to sort of take a bunch of different, take a bunch of different uh, transcription factors that bind in sort of acidic conditions and combine uh, like the, the binding sites together, and they were able to get uh, a significant induction. Um, and then finally, for uh, genetic circuits, uh, this lab, uh, Chatterjee's lab, built this really interesting uh, way of tuning gene expression using sort of uh, overlapping uh, uh, promoters, which sort of transcribe in this direction and this direction, and then the RNA polymerases collide with each other. And you can either get sort of synergistic effects where if you turn this one on, this one will get more activated, or you can get negative effects where you tune this one down. So it's just an interesting tunable way of uh, controlling gene expression. Um, and then this lab, uh, Jeff Hastie's lab, uh, did something that was, I thought was uh, very cool. They engineered salmonella uh, bacteria to uh, basically lyse themselves and reduce a, re release a chemotherapeutic when you uh, when they grow too dense. And they use these salmonella to actually infect tumors and tumor cells in uh, mice. And in combination with chemotherapy, these sort of cycles of lysing uh, salmonella were able to reduce tumor load and actually increase the survival of the mice. Um, so, and so in sort of CRISPR research, uh, there was uh, a paper that came out sort of comparing uh, CRISPR sort of uh, gene regulation techniques to uh, other programmable uh, DNA binding proteins, ta uh, uh, tal vectors. Um, and the conclusion of this was basically that uh, tal vectors are actually much better at repressing gene expression programmably and also activating gene expression programmably. Um, but CRISP uh, CRISPR-based systems are easier to program. So like once you find a system uh, that works, you might want to switch from CRISPR to tal. And then you guys have all heard of uh, gene drives, you know, pushing things through, po pushing genes through a population using uh, uh, CRISPR. Um, in this case, uh, so Kevin Asbel, the guy who originally proposed uh, CRISPR-based gene drives, uh, basically he's come up with a way that it, uh, to make it a little safer, so it doesn't necessarily sort of propagate through the entire global population of uh, organisms. And basically, you. You start with one component of a gene drive that doesn't propagate, and then you have like three other components, and so you get like this local, um, this local spread of the, the gene through the population, but then it peters out over time. Um, so CPF1 is sort of a CRISPR analog um, that, that was recently discovered by uh, what's his name, the, the guy at MIT, um, and so <laughs> you know the one who's not out now. Uh, and so uh, there's been sort of more development of uh, CDF1 as a technology. And this paper actually shows that CDF1 is a much more specific uh, nuclease than Cas9, and it has much lower off target effects. So if you look, so this is the number of sort of off targets uh, for CDF1 variants versus Cas9. Um, and so uh, I would say that this is for wild type Cas9. There have been variants of Cas9 that have been engineered that are more uh, sort of resistant to. Uh, off-target cleavage. Um, and then also, uh, because CPF1 <coughs> is actually able to cleave DNA strands and leave an overhang, uh, somebody built a sort of bio-brick-based assembly standard using CPF1, so you can start, start, start uh, sort of putting together standard biological parts uh, or modules uh, using this, and you don't need to use restriction enzymes, you can just use CPF1. Um, and then finally, sort of just on, on the Symbio software part uh, uh, front, uh, this sort of atlas of biochemistry was de developed. So this is basically a map of all sort of known metabolites um, and all known enzymes that catalyze the generation of those small molecule metabolites. And then also all possible novel uh, sort of uh, using those enzymes, what possible small molecule metabolites could you build? Um, and so that, that could be very useful if you're trying to like engineer a, a metabolic pathway. Um, and then just sort of uh, finally, there's a, uh, a BioParts DB, Jeff, uh, Jeff Beek's lab came out with this. And it's the, sort of the first uh, uh, software workflow that allows you to start with like short oligonucleotides and use those to build a bunch of, uh, like do overlap PCR, build up your longer genetic construct. And this sort of software uh, workflow helps you go through the whole process of PCR all the way through uh, sort of transformation and sequencing.
And then finally, so this is just the last thing. Uh, I just thought this uh, was a, a cool paper about building biology and understand it. So uh, this, uh, uh, these two uh, researchers are we're trying to figure out why um, multicellular organisms have sort of stem cells that divide but aren't differentiated, and then somatic cells that are differentiated but don't divide. Uh, and so they actually modify yeast to be a simple multicellular organism. Um, and what they found was that uh, basically in multicellular organisms, you really want the, the sort of differentiated cells to not divide because if they uh, divide, then they'll start sort of propagating out of control and out-competing the uh, somatic cells, um, sort, of, sort of like cancer. Um, so that's sort of all the news that I have. And now we'll uh, start talking about seed. <laughs>